So before I start talking about the digital economy, I just want to reflect on a couple of things we heard earlier this morning. Um, a, a couple of the items Sanjeeva mentioned uh, resonated particularly with me around culture. And um, I'm, a, I'm a managing director of CapabilityWise. We're a digital consultancy. So we're um, in that culture space all the time. And um, looking beyond the hype, uh, to me, is one of those things that, that just jumped out at me. That's, I've spent the last year um, on a daily basis saying, I understand that that's a, a hot topic, right? This technology is the shiny one on the, on the shelf at the moment. But uh, when you're looking at transformation at an economy-wide scale, um, the shiny toy is not always the best toy. So looking beyond that hype, looking at what the reality is of that technology being implemented, uh, I think is a critical factor. And um, tied very closely with that, is um, recognising things change. Because that shiny toy on the shelf right now, in two years' time, might be commonplace. So there are two items that, that came out of those conversations this morning that I thought particularly resonated with me. So let's jump into embracing the digital economy. Right? So this is digital transformation on a, on a bigger scale. So um, let me talk about the Digital Business Council first of all. Uh, the Digital Business Council is a multi-stakeholder forum that was established in 2015. Um, it was uh, kicked off by the Australian Business Register, or the, the ATO, um, in order to facilitate um, improving the way business and B2B transactions occurred in Australia. Um, the membership and, uh, is quite varied, um, but predominantly the council itself is made up of uh, a number of peak bodies. It's chaired by the CEO of the Council of Small Business of Australia, um, it has a number of accounting bodies on it, um, a number of IT industry bodies, and uh, a couple of large IT accounting software companies. And there's something going on funny with the slide there, but anyway. Um, so what do they do? Well, their mandate is transforming the ways Australians do business, but uh, particularly looking at uh, the procure-to-pay life cycle. Can I just have a show of hands who understands what I mean when I say procure-to-pay? A handful. Okay. So procure-to-pay is really... Um, from a business context, uh, all the way through from uh, deciding I want to buy something, right, finding it in a catalogue, locating it somehow, placing an order for that product or service, um, receiving that service or product, um, the supplier ultimately invoicing for the delivery of that, and uh, effectively at the end of that process, receiving payment for that service or product and reconciling that within your accounts. So that's that entire life cycle of actually buying something off another business. Right. So that's what the council's been looking at. And how are they supported? Um, how have they got from A to B somehow is hidden. Um, uh, so the Australian Business Register has uh, been providing secretariat services to the council. Right? But uh, that's where it gets interesting for me as a digital consultancy. Um, Capability-wise has been supporting the Digital Business Council to achieve their outcomes, uh, providing uh, standards adoption and interoperability guidance. Um, proof of concept and early adoption uh, support capabilities and uh, general transformation um, advice. So let's jump into the detail. So one of the things I mentioned as part of that procure to pay life cycle is invoicing. So why are you invoicing? Does anyone know how much it costs for their organisation to process one invoice? I'll tell you what some of the averages are. And it's pretty scary. To process a paper invoice is around $30, right? To process a PDF invoice is around $28. That's the average, so that's accounting for people either manually transcribing and keying things in, or OCR processes that are, um, are picking up content off those invoices, right? And we all know that OCR processes are only as good until the supplier changes their data format because they like blue instead of pink. Right. So that's a happy day scenario, right? So around $30, around that mark for processing an invoice. Um, the sad reality is, though, that one out of three invoices in Australia actually have a data quality problem. And to process one of those invoices is actually reaching up around the $60 range. All right, so $60 to process one piece of paper or one PDF that has some data quality issues. And even worse, one in five just get delivered just to the wrong person completely within an organisation to actually take action on that invoice. So that's the state of play at the moment in Australia. So what's the cost of an e-invoice? About $9. Right. So 
looking at those figures, you go, yeah, okay, $20 saving. Now let's put that in context. In Australia each year, more than a billion invoices change hands between businesses. All right. So fixing that data quality issue, it's about a nine and a half, ten billion dollar productivity gain for the economy. All right. So that's substantial. All right. How do we get that? Well, uh, having standardised ways of transmitting e-invoices means data quality is improved. Right. But it also opens up other opportunities. Um, there's the opportunity for that data to feed straight into your accounts payable system, right, ready for approval and processing. There's opportunities to do process automation, um, uh, implement best practice activities, um, including three-way matching and those kind of things. And uh, I didn't actually realise how bad the situation was until I actually got out there and started talking to people. One organisation that I was speaking to recently um, do salary packaging for their staff, right? So salary package vehicles for their staff. Um, this organisation has more than 10,000 employees, so on the big end of town, right? Um, and they do it through one preferred salary packaging provider. Now, every month, that provider sends them a series of invoices. Each invoice has 50 lines, which relate to one car, which relate to one employee, right? Now their process actually requires them to match a purchase order to an invoice line item, right? And then enter that into their financial system. But the reality is today, the way they do it is they actually take that one invoice that arrives and realise that it has 50 different people's information on it and they run it through the photocopier 50 times. Right? Then they put 50 paper invoices in 50 paper files and then someone manually keys in the relevant line item into their financial system. And this is a really big organisation, right? So that's the way they're working today. What does e-invoicing give them? It gives them the opportunity to um, tag each line within an invoice with that purchase order number in advance, to do automated checks, to check against um, financial thresholds, right? to do risk analytics, those kind of things. Um, so it's really creating opportunities to change the way accounts payable and accounts receivable work. So let me move on from that. The Australian Small Business and Family Ombudsman uh, recently ran a report into late payment times in Australia. So Australia, in terms of uh, OECD uh, countries, is actually lagging significantly. We're number 19 in terms of late payments. The top six countries, they actually pay before a due date on an invoice. Uh, the top 12, which includes the US, the UK, um, China, Japan, most of the European Union, all pay within seven days of a due date. In Australia, we pay around 26 days after the due date. Right. Now, that doesn't sound like a huge problem until you start doing the maths behind that and you realise that, as an economy, we have $26 billion, and those numbers line up quite nicely, $26 billion worth of outstanding invoices at any one point in time. Right, so there's a huge amount of money tied up in unpaid or late payments. Right. And the uh, major cause of late payments is actually incorrect invoice information. So, that seems pretty obvious. Um, when you look at those numbers, when you talk about it, um, why wouldn't you do invoicing? Right? And, hey, it's not a brand new idea. Um, look to the US. Walmart decided that um, a digital supply chain was the way to go back in 2002, right? They, they enforced that across their supply chain at that point in time. So why in 2017, in Australia, are we having a conversation about electronic invoicing? Well, change is not easy, right? And there's barriers to change. And let me run through what some of those are. Because every digital transformation activity, you're going to come across barriers and you have to know how to solve them. First of all, something called islands of trade, or business, uh, business networks is another term being used at the moment, but it kind of gets a bit mixed up with blockchain. Um, but islands of trade. Basically what an island of trade is, is that a large buyer who has massive buying power mandates a particular way of working on their supply chain. So Walmart, that example, is a great example. In Australia, there's about 35 islands of trade where a big buyer has said to all of their supply chain, if you want to deal with me, you're going to deal with me this way. You're going to use this technology. You're going to use 
these techniques, you're going to uh, get paid on this time schedule. Okay? So there's some entrenched behaviour across those 35 big organisations. Each one of those is a proprietary foothold. Right? Um, those organisations have gone and they've picked a proprietary standard. Right? So everyone who joins that supply chain, that network, is paying potentially a fee for service right, per transaction. Um, in some scenarios, the buyer and supplier are paying on both ends of that transaction. Right? Others are paying just to use the proprietary technology that exists. Right? So there's a huge barrier uh, in that space as well. Let me give you an example. Um, let's take a fictitious pineapple grower in Queensland. Right? Grows the best pineapples in Australia. Now he wants to sell his pineapples to our major supermarket chains. He wants to sell it to Coles, to Woolies, um, and to our independents. Right. Each one of those organisations or islands of trade have their own proprietary way that they have to deal. So the small businessman, right, or small or medium enterprise, the pineapple grower, actually has to invest in three technology solutions or potentially two technology solutions and does the other a different way. Right. And although there's some commonality between those two, so um, Coles and Woolies, they both use the same technology standard. They both use 90% of the same technology standard, but they use a different 90%. Right? So there is some crossover, but they're different. So each time someone wants to trade with someone new, there's increased expense, right? particularly if they're trying to deal with large buyers in Australia. There's commercial interests. Um, the unfortunate reality is that there's a number of software companies out there today um, who are providing software in, in this B2B commerce space, who are using 1980s technology and selling it at a premium price still today. Right? That's, that's the reality of it. Right? So there's a commercial disincentive for change. And finally, that market imbalance that I talked about before. Um, this country has about 2 million small businesses. Right? The power in the invoicing space at the moment sits with a handful of large businesses. Right, it's a massive power imbalance. So there's some of the key barriers that uh, are preventing e-invoicing from happening in this country. And that's what the Digital Business Council set out to overcome. So how have we got through those barriers? And I've got, is it an art, is it a science? Well, look, frankly, it's a little bit of both. But it's about change management more than anything. It's about the culture, it's about the people. Right. Um, first of all, establishing a passionate community. It's one thing to get a bunch of passionate people, um, technologists together to do something. Um, but when you're talking about an economy-wide problem like this, we need more than just technologists. We need, and that's why our council is made up of uh, accountants, technologists, um, a bunch of other industry bodies. Um, we've got Standards Australia as an observer, etc. cetera. Um, in order to have that passionate, broad community right, and have them really engaged. But the other part of this is we talked about commercial interests before. Um, having someone in a leadership role in that space who is impartial, right, who has a vested interest in seeing a positive outcome for the Australian community, but not a vested interest in a particular solution. Right. Eliminating unhealthy competition. Now, I'm not saying get rid of competition, don't make any money in this space. That's, that's the exact opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if we... Bring together a community of people to work on a problem. We can't have them sitting around the table, each thinking about their own commercial position before putting something out there. Um, the number of meetings I've been to over the years where we've had uh, stakeholder groups from multiple organisations that are competing with each other, where um, you have a meeting, half a dozen words are said by each throughout the meeting, and then the real work happens at lunchtime because everyone walks outside and they have the open conversation with you or with others who are in a facilitator role that they wouldn't have at the table with their competitors. So we had to take that off the table, right? Had to get rid of that problem straight away. So how do we do that? Well, a bunch of things. Um, we put conditions of participation in place for every member of the working groups and the council itself, which basically required them to represent the best interests of the economy before their company and to restrict uh, any competitive information that came out through those discussions 
to themselves or their immediate delegate in their organisation. Um, not sharing that with the broader organisation, not running back and going to the sales team, hey, did you know company XYZ is having problems here, etc. Okay. Um, open standards, right? So uh, we looked at it and went, okay, let's take competition off. Let's make sure that no one organisation is receiving commercial benefit um, by virtue of the choice of standards that we chose. And finally, open source. So everything that's been produced by the Digital Business Council is released under Creative Commons, right? Anyone can pick it up and use it. And in fact, we're seeing um, a couple of areas at the moment uh, who are actually picking that up and using it for things outside of invoicing, which is its uh, initial state of intent. And finally, we set ambitious targets. It's one thing to get people around a table and start having a conversation, but if you don't have a target in mind, if you don't say, by this date or by this time, here's what we want to get done, it just will never happen, right? The work expands to fill the space available. So in this scenario, we said to ourselves, we want an interoperable framework that allows participants across the economy to trade and do e-invoicing together, regardless of their existing technology background, right? Within six months, right? Very aggressive. But that came with some trade-offs. Balancing ambition and maturity, right? By setting that short time frame, we need to be quite cognizant of where existing investment and existing capability is within the economy. We can't go and say, within six months, it's all going to be blockchain, right? Um, so it's about balancing ambition and balancing maturity. So I mentioned an interoperability framework. What is an interoperability framework? Um, and this is where uh, the magic happens in the invoicing space. We've got a flexible solution, basically, a framework that's broken into a series of tiers. At the very highest level, you've got uh, a layer which is uh, legal interoperability, right? So legal and regulation, right? In invoicing, um, that's the GST Act, right? That's what defines what a tax invoice is. Um, organisational interoperability, semantics, so information and data meaning, and then ultimately the bottom of that, technology, right? How do we plug the technology together? And the concept um, comes right back to that, uh, that composable and uh, constantly changing uh, approach that, that Sanjeeva mentioned before. Any item within those layers should be able to change without significant impact on any other layer in the framework. Right? So inside each of those layers, we've got a series of building blocks. Right? One is a messaging and communication building block. Another is an end-to-end -end, um, security encryption building block. Uh, another is a dynamic uh, discovery building block. Right? The idea is that those building blocks can be reused across multiple transaction types, be it an invoice, be it an order, be it something else, right? And composed together in such a way that makes sense for the use case at hand, right? And any one of those building blocks could be substituted for another one in the future, if and when it makes sense, right? When that technology matures, when the industry matures, um, it needs to be flexible for the future. And ultimately, fostering and facilitating early adoption and that, that, I think, is, is probably the key to the, the successful start to e-invoicing. And I say successful start because the journey's not over yet. It's only just beginning. Um, a couple of organisations put their hand up and said, we really see some benefit here. And you'll see some logos that are household names later. Um, those organisations said, we want to get involved. We want to do it. We want to prove what's going on here. We want to prove this thing has value for us. So the Digital Business Council and, uh, and my company as well uh, supported some of these organisations through those proof of concept activities, um, be it uh, clarifying uh, technology choices, decisions, or uh, actually just joining parties together so that they could um, test together. And the key to this is really knowing you can be hands-on, but you need to know when to get out of the way. Right? There comes a point uh, with any transformation where you just need to get out. Right? Um, when two organisations start talking about uh, commercial contracts for production solutions, that's no place for, for the council to play in. Right? So, where does WSO2 fit into this scenario here? Um, when we looked at the technology available, particularly in the message communication space, 
Um, there were a few options on the table. There was, uh, you know, build your own, build your own software from scratch to meet the AS4 standard, which is the selected standard of choice. Um, you can uh, purchase a, a high-end commercial offering, and when I say high-end, I'm talking uh, potentially tens of thousands per CPU per annum to run. Um, or you can partner with another provider who's already invested. So we looked at the landscape, and there was a gap. Right? There were a couple of open source products that were, um, were available uh, with limited support, um, and, uh, and some that, that came with support, but a very, very high price as well. We're talking 500 euro per hour right, support for it. So there was no viable option in the space. Um, so what WSO2 has done is they've developed a custom mediator for uh, the Enterprise Integrator product, right? which uh, basically anyone using that product now and that mediator can communicate within the, um, the framework. Right? Um, so they've combined Enterprise class open source product with appropriate subscription and support um, arrangements to enable you to get your project off and running quickly. Right? So, let's talk about success and failure. Right. Um, it's important to celebrate success with any transformation. It's important, as we heard before, to celebrate or recognise any failure and learn from it. Um, success, well, we got our framework out the door in six months. Um, we had a Gartner analyst look at it and, and uh, say it was one of the best written documents they'd seen. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and ultimately, we've had a number of industry players um, adopt that and implement it, right? So that's the measure of success for that one. Um, now, I talked about community. Across that, that 12 to 18 month period, and that number's a little out of date now, 1,800 voluntary hours, right, committed by industry to support the initiative, right? Um, that's across about 60 organisations that um, filled various roles from uh, technical consulting advisory through to uh, adoption or governance um, support. So it's a significant contribution from, um, and voluntary contribution from the community. We've got 27 provisionally accredited service providers. And we've undertaken a number of successful proof of concepts. Um, the first one was Commonwealth Bank and Telstra. Um, they were two organisations that looked at it and went, we see significant value for us here. Right. They undertook the first proof of concept. And there's others that are not shown there yet. Um, I haven't updated the slide. So where could we have done better? Well, I think when you objectively look back at all of it, you could do better on everything. Right? You never do everything perfectly all the time. Um, I think one of the places that, that we, we excelled and we had weakness at the same time is that we had great community engagement, great industry engagement, right? and we actually got this framework up and out the door really, really quickly. Um, what couldn't follow quite as quickly is the operational model and the governance process around it, right? Because it's all well and good to have a bunch of interoperable systems out there, but if they're not accredited, if they're not assured, if you don't engender trust in that network, um, then you've got a problem. Right? So we have an accreditation model that is still in its final stages of development at the moment. Right? The framework's been out there for 12 months. Um, it's taken us another 12 months to get that um, underway. And uh, that, um, that, to me, that problem is actually more of a cultural problem, um, dealing with commercials and legals and those kind of things than dealing with um, technology. Technology is the easy part of all of this transformation. Okay. So where to from here? Um, We've got a framework that allows Australian businesses to uh, do electronic invoicing, um, cross-border interoperability. So we didn't get to having a framework in six months just by starting with a blank page. Right? We actually stood on the shoulders of those that have come before us and looked to the European Union and the pan-European public procurement online program, um, which has been doing government-based procurement uh, in Europe with various standards for about 10 years now. Um, so we took some of the decisions and some of the learnings from that space, applied them, and then leapfrogged them from a technology perspective. So the technology standards we've chosen in Australia um, 
in Europe in September this year, they'll release their implementation guidance to support that same set of technology standards. So we're going to do some cross-border trading to prove that an invoice created in the Australian context works perfectly well across the European Union. And uh, also there'll be some others closer to home that I, I can't announce just yet. Um, we'll be looking at additional business processes. So invoicing is just that middle bit of the procure to pay life cycle. What happens after it in terms of payments, uh, in terms of remittance advice? There's a huge opportunity there. Um, the new payments platform uh, goes live in October in Australia, so that's a real-time payments platform for those that don't know. Right? And instead of waiting three days for settlement, etc., cetera, um, you know, we're talking 12 seconds. Right? Um, but one of the things that come with that is that uh, instead of having to know someone's BSB and account number, you can say, I want to pay to this ABN. Right? So in the invoice fraud world, if I have an invoice from an organisation and I go, I'm going to pay it, and I pay it to an ABN, and I don't have to worry about the bank details, I suddenly take out a huge invoice fraud vector. Right? So that improves the stability and the health of the entire environment. Uh, and back the other way, uh, looking at um, that ordering uh, process up to the invoice itself. And ultimately looking at emerging technologies. And as I said before about the hype curve, and I've mentioned blockchain a couple of times, in the early days of this project, a bunch of people said, oh, it should be blockchain. This has to be blockchain. Um, the reality was that the industry and the participants in the place at the moment were not mature enough to adopt that across the entire economy. Two, three, five years' time, that's going to be a totally different story. Right? So the framework needs to change and adapt over time as a result. So that's about it for me. Um, I recommend you get onto the Digital Business Council website, have a look at it, uh, have a look at the framework itself and the underpinning standards. Right? Um, by all means, get involved, right? the more the merrier. And I'll be around for the rest of the day as well if you want to come and grab me and have a chat about anything as well. And that's about it from me. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions they wanted to ask before I disappear? Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, Pete. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the security and we talked about, you know, uh, she really talked about security. Mm -hmm. How is, or, and the idea of building trust into the framework, how are you using security now to maintain that trust and or, through a federated identity or through that open identity amongst businesses? How did I know you were going to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> So look, identity is, uh, I think, one of the challenges that we have uh, as a country, as a whole, um, at the moment. There are some identity providers and identity services in existence uh, for business to government usage um, that, as they currently stand, can't be leveraged for business to business usage. Right? Um, that landscape is changing a bit at the moment, um, but we're a ways off from having a final solution. Um, so the framework that's in place uh, at the moment um, has high integrity measures around accreditation of participants directly in the framework and sets expectations for them on how they do identity proofing for their upstream customers um, and requires them to bring their own credential from a set, a whitelisted set of source um, uh, credential providers. Right? So it's not ideal. Uh, in the future, I see us in a, a fully token-based um, identity solution that uh, can be used across that business to business, business to government uh, realm seamlessly. So in, in the future um, space there around other things, uh, cross-border fulfilment, right, where you've got goods moving from business A to business B across an uh, um, international border. Right? That process involves two businesses but also involves a series of government agencies as well. Um, you, you've got customs and immigration or customs processes, you've got um, quarantine and agricultural processes. Um, that should be treated as one seamless business process. Right? That's, that's the council's view of that. Um, it, it shouldn't be um, we deal with government this way, we deal with other businesses that way. Right? So I've answered your question in the roundabout way, I think. Um, but I, I recognise that's, that's somewhere where this country has plenty of work to do. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing them using any some processes or technology to overcome those? 
They are. Um, look, at the moment, it's, it's, uh, it depends where you look. Right? So there's some PKI-based um, things. Uh, you look at Estonia, um, they're, they're miles ahead, um, smaller population. Um, their keyless signature infrastructure is blockchain. Right? Um, but it, as I said, it's all about balancing the maturity. And um, uh, you know, a great product in one country might not be a great product in another application. Sorry, it's in Ian Richards from Integration yep. Works. Um, you mentioned previously about the um, supply chain standards. Mm -hmm. um, are the standards that the council have, um, are looking to, are they compatible with the universal business language um, standards? At a semantic level, universal business language is the choice. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's an OASIS or an ISO standard, actually, for those that are not familiar. Um, so that provides all the semantic definitions across the procure to pay um, life cycle. Uh, and we've also uh, adopted um, UBL XML as the, the data format, uh, certainly initially. Um, there's some international work happening on OASIS around JSON representation of that same uh, semantic model as well. Uh, so we're watching that very closely. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the blockchain mm -hmm. and the way it was presented that it's not, we are not yet there in particularly for invoicing, I believe. Did you have any survey done or anything? What are the hurdles? I just want to understand sure. the blockchain, what is stopping it to go forward? And waiting for five years or four years, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. seems like a very unrealistic. So is any... So nothing's, nothing's necessarily stopping us from going forward with that, and it's, it's under active investigation at the moment, right? Um, the challenge is, and that was a comment made earlier, is that change actually takes time, right? And uh, the selection of the standards base that we've got today uh, is recognising that that change can take effect more quickly. And if we have an interoperable economy working a particular way in six to 12 months' time, um, that next hop and that next um, technology substitution actually becomes much more easy to achieve. Great, I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>